I am so pleased and so happy that Dr. Linda Kikivish um, accepted our invitation to come and um, speak with us, offer this teaching on Palestine. Um, Kiki, um, known to us belovedly as Kiki, <laughs> um, is a popular educator, a geographer, um, and an expert on Israel-Palestine. Um, her forthcoming book, uh, Palestine 1492, should be available within the next few months, and we will alert you when that um, is available. And um, I really can't think of anybody else I would want to invite <laughs> um, more than I would want to invite Kiki. And so thank you so much, Kiki, for um, joining us today. And um, I will pass the floor to you. And um, please let me know um, during the Q&A or however one you want to structure it. I'm happy to help uh, read the questions or um, if you need some help with mm. going back and forth with that. Um, that sounds good. Okay, so I will remove myself. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to be here. I always take any opportunity I can to talk about Palestine, uh, largely because it's something, it's a topic that I had to really struggle with for a very long time. I'm not Palestinian. I'm not Arab. I'm not Muslim. I'm not Jewish. I'm not at all even from the, that hemisphere. I'm from here. I'm Native American of Maya roots. And the way that I got interested in Palestine was really out of a, a cognitive dissonance that I had because I grew up a very young. Uh, when I was nine years old, I was introduced to Anna Frank and I was traumatized. I think a lot of us who first learn about the Holocaust of Jews uh, and in particular through the writings of a, of a child, of a, of a, of a girl who was a, a young lady really was traumatic and I was really happy that there was a place for Jews that allowed Jews to feel safe called Israel. I was happy that the United States supported Israel for a very long time. I tried to get a lot of answers from the adults and none of the adults around me could tell me anything other than yes, the Holocaust happened. But you know, like when you're a kid, you're always asking, well, why? <laughs> and there was no, no reply to that. So I was just really happy that it was over. So I thought that Holocausts were over. And later in life, um, so that was the 80s. So later in life, in, the, in probably 2000 and around 9-11, I started to learn about Palestinians. And I didn't know who they had been. I didn't know that Israel had been created on top of Palestinian lands. And so I became really confused because I was hearing a lot of stuff on the news about how Palestinians are terrorists and they're terrorizing Jews in Israel. And of course, I wasn't going to stand for that. I grew up uh, very much with an anti-racist uh, orientation in my life, very social justice minded. But at the same time, I was hearing that Palestinians were suffering too. So it was really confusing. I didn't have anyone that I could turn to that I knew that I trusted about it. Um, I had books. <laughs> books were my friends and the internet. And, and I was confused for a, a very, very long time. And I decided that after the war in Iraq, that the media was lying. And I think a lot of us realize that. And so I felt like, well, I needed to see for myself because I had felt that this was so close to me because I had felt so, so um, correct in my positions about Israel from what I had learned from the media. I wanted to make sure that that was right. So after a lot of soul searching, and a self-study where I became kind of obsessed because it started to unravel a lot of lies from my perspective, lies um, that had been told to me 
about the world, uh, I wanted to learn more. So when I was doing a PhD in geography, I was already very skeptical of borders. Um, I entered geography because I wanted to know why places were laid out the way they were. Like, why is Los Angeles the way Los Angeles is, which is where I'm from. And so I was going to do a PhD on the Guatemala-Mexico border, which is a border that my family had to cross before crossing the US-Mexico border. And while I was there, I, I had already been doing a self-study on Palestine-Israel and a war broke out, Israel's war on Lebanon in summer of 2006. And I had just visited the region backpacking by myself, just kind of like not knowing anyone, just kind of getting the vibes for myself. And I started to, to study some more. And so when that war happened, all I could do was think about what was going on there. I started to learn about Rafah crossing, the crossing between Gaza and Egypt and how how violent that border was and that it was closed a lot of the time Israel and Egypt controlled it together there were women who'd have who'd give birth at the border just waiting for the border to open up and so i decided to change my whole phd project from the mexico guatemala border to the borders of israel palestine and that's what i did my entire phd in i was not satisfied with starting with the given maps that we are given. I wanted to know how those borders were created. So what I'm going to present to you is my PhD research plus a lot more um, analysis that I have generated since about how this connects to all of us all over the world. Studying the borders of Israel-Palestine without me knowing would lead me to 1492. And it's something that a lot of the time we don't hear about. We often hear about the Israel-Palestine um, so-called conflicts starting in the 19th century when Jews were fleeing Europe to try to feel safe from anti-Semitism. And, and what that does is if we just start there, we start to think that this is just something going on between Jews and Arabs or Jews and Muslims or Jews and Palestinians, where to me, I, I argue that it's a problem of the world. So in order for things to change there, the whole world needs to change. And by the world, I mean the world built by 1492. So I'm going to start there uh, by showing you a lot of maps. Um, and I'm gonna start with this map. I'm just gonna leave the PowerPoint like this, if that's okay. This is a map very, it's, it's, a, it's an artistic rendering of the mental maps of the world that Europeans held before 1492. This particular map was printed in 1581, so almost a hundred years later. And it shows the Americas over on the bottom left corner <clears throat> but it kind of serves like as a bridge to, to see how the conceptions of space in the European mind uh, were shifting with 1492. Traditionally, medieval maps of the world from Europe understood that there are three continents, and that's what the Bible said, Europe, Asia, and Africa. So here is a, a it's called a clover leaf map, so like three leaves. Europe, Asia, Africa, and in the middle is Jerusalem, which is really important uh, because I talk a lot about the spiritual dimensions in, in addition to the material dimensions of Israel-Palestine. And a lot of the time they are split. Some folks want to focus only on the religious or spiritual aspects. Other folks want to say it's not, it's not religious, it's material. And I want to say it's both. We don't have to pick. And so in the European medieval mind, the world was centered on Jerusalem. And that is still very much uh, the case in the spirituality or in the cosmovision, maybe we might call it the worldview of Europeans 
uh, who built the world of 1492. It's very much a Christian uh, interpretation of how the world should be. And, and I'll show a little bit more as we go. But here you see this map. And what's really interesting about it, uh, in addition to it being a, a, these clovers, is that you know, it's back when like maps had like the, the mermaids and the, and the monsters. And so if we look over at the Indian Ocean between Asia and Africa, we'll see like the, the exotic renderings. There's, there's a mer mermaid or a merman. And then if, and, and if you go down closer to, to the south, there's, a, there's a, a sea creature. What was going on in the Indian Ocean at the time was that it was very heavily active in a lot of trade that the Europeans in the West, Western Europe, weren't really a part of. So there was a, an obsession for them to enter. And so the Portuguese were navigating um, under, you know, south and around Africa to get there because going through to, you know, through uh, the Mediterranean, through Jerusalem for was really difficult because there was a Muslim and Muslim empire there, many Muslim empires and other empires that uh, Europeans understood as enemies. There had already been the Crusades in the 11th century to the 13th century. And um, a lot of that, you know, history, we can talk about the fall of the Roman empire on, on the West and the, and then the rise of Islam, which is also really important. But what's important also to understand is that there is debate among scholars over when the modern world was created. A lot of us say 1492, and I don't like to just say dates um, because you know they're kind of just like bookends to 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 events. They're they, they're not really um, the beginnings of certain moments. They're more like ruptures that allow for other things to happen. But but other scholars say that maybe it was 1453 when the Roman Empire fell. The Roman Empire in the East, the Byzantine Empire, uh, Constantinople had fallen to the Muslims, to the Ottomans, and it's been renamed today. Um, we know it as Istanbul. And so to the east, there it, it was hostile for Europeans to go. And so there was focus on going west to get to Jerusalem. And that was Christopher Columbus's main reason for sailing west. And that's something that we find in his diaries. And it's not something that's often talked about. Usually what's talked about is that he was just trying to get rich. But that was really secondary for what he really wanted. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. I just wanna show before we move on from this map over to the West, here we see a, a ship sailing and a beast. So you have these conceptions of the world. Those sea monsters are really important for signaling to us what areas of the world of the seas Europeans understood as scary and which ones they understood as exotic. And so this map, because it's this medieval three clover map with Jerusalem in the center, gets disrupted with the discovery of the lands here of Abiyayala, later to be called the Americas, because the Bible never mentioned us. And so 1492 becomes a, a major rupture in the way that Europeans understand the world because there is this entire landmass that was not mentioned in the Bible. And so it comes at this conjuncture where there's also this growing humanism that kind of shifts the, the source of knowledge from God to man, to rational man, uh, and the explorers who go and, and, and can come back and testify to what they've seen now have a lot of answers and descriptions that the Bible didn't have. So it creates an enormous shift. And so here I wanna also point the, the, the how this is understood as sacred geography. This is a type of map that elevates Jerusalem 
to its sacred center for the European map. But maps today, if we go to a more contemporary map where we see Jerusalem, this is a, uh, a map of the proposed state of Palestine with a two-state solution where Jerusalem is to be the capital of a Palestinian state. And you can you can see the font size. So, so East Jerusalem is where the holy sites are, where it says Jerusalem, that's West Jerusalem. That's the part that Israelis have built up. Um, but East Jerusalem is where the, the noble sanctuary is, the Dome of the Rock. Um, and that's where the, the Jewish temples have been built. But you notice that the you can't really tell how sacred Jerusalem is. The font size is about the same size as the font size for Tel Aviv, which is the capital of Israel, and Amman, the capital of Jordan. And so a secularization of Jerusalem, which is mostly what the maps are now depicting with the um, the two-state solution and the, over the last 30 years, the negotiations between Palestinians and Israelis is really treating Jerusalem as any other place that could be swapped for other land. So the secularization of Jerusalem through this map makes it so that it, 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 it communicates that Jerusalem can just be interchanged just like any other place. And I, and I want to just confirm this is a proposed map because there is no state of Palestine. There's some confusion that Israel-Palestine is a conflict, quote unquote, between states, between different armies, uh, you know, equivalent armies, equivalent governments, and, and that's not the case. So I want to make sure that we understand this was just proposed. But I use it just to show that the ways that maps have changed, and it's not to say that one map is better than the other. Uh, what it is to say is that when one way of mapping is dominant, is hegemonic, we lose a lot. We gain some things, but we lose a lot. And what we lose is the understanding of the importance of Jerusalem, and not only to Palestinians who are Muslim and Christian and Many Palestinians uh, were Jewish until Israel uh, was created and Israel had them become Israelis and speak Hebrew instead of Arabic. And it created this division among sects where Israel is for Jews. And so there, there could no longer be such a thing, according to Israel, as a Palestinian Jew. Uh, Palestinians are non-Jews for Israel, although Jews have lived here together with Christians and Muslims for millennia and um, allowed to live as Jews. And that's something that is, it was common throughout uh, uh, a lot of the Muslim world. So I'm gonna show another map and now we're gonna go to the Iberian Peninsula at the end of the 15th century. So this is before it becomes Spain and Portugal although the outlines of Portugal are there over on the left, the kingdom of Portugal that becomes the state of Portugal. This area had been ruled by Muslims for hundreds of years since the eighth century. And what it, what it did for Rome, for the Vatican, uh, was it made, it made the Catholics feel that Islam is taking over their territories on the east and on the west, and they're being surrounded. So for centuries, there was a drive from the Vatican with the, the Catholic monarchs to take back these lands uh, as they understood it, taking it back. They call it the Reconquista, as if, you know, it was supposed to always be Christian. And so what happens in 1492 that we don't talk enough about, we're not taught enough about, isn't just October 12th when Christopher Columbus lands on these lands in the Caribbean, encounters the Taino people and enslaves and genocides them. 
Before that, that same year, on January 2nd, 1492, if you notice the south, the pink area, the Emirate of Granada, that becomes, that is the last Muslim stronghold after many centuries of, of war against the Muslims, sometimes called the Moors, uh, between the Catholic kingdoms and the Moors and the Muslims. In 1492, on January 2nd, Granada surrenders. Granada is the last stronghold. And that is huge news in the Iberian Peninsula and throughout Catholicism, because for them, it means that the these lands, Europe, as they understand it, compared to Africa down south, are now Catholic and can be ethnically cleansed. And that's exactly what the kingdoms of Castile, so Isabella's kingdom of Castile and the kingdom of Aragon, together through marriage uh, battle for the ethnic cleansing of the Iberian Peninsula. Whereas before under Muslim rule, Christians, Jews and Muslims lived together with the, with, with the wars, the Catholic wars against the Muslims, their drive was to make it so that the lands would be only Catholic only Catholic. So Muslims were not allowed to be Muslims. They were kicked out. And immediately then Jews were forced to convert and they had already been uh, discriminated against for centuries. This heightened the what's called the Spanish Inquisition. Jews who converted to Catholicism, some of them converted so that they could remain but in secret, they would continue practicing their faith. And when the monarchs got wind of this, they would torture them into confessing. Um, neighbors who would get upset at other neighbors could even, you know, point the finger and say someone, you know, so and so is fake converted, even if it's not true. And the state would uh, arrest and torture and often kill. Uh, those who they believed were lying, which is not that different from what many of us experienced on 9-11, like the idea that you should call, if you see something, say something, you know, tell on your neighbors if, if of anything. So the, the Spanish Inquisition really took it, it went into effect. It's interesting to, uh, to understand the legacy of this in modern Spain. In a couple of ways, one, when, when you go to Spain and you go to Granada, you go to Madrid and you see monuments to 1492, they have those two dates, January 2nd and October 12th, 1492, as the making of Spain. And another way that you see it that isn't often remarked about is the the, gastrono the, the the gastronomy of Spain. The food has a lot of pork. It's kind of like excessive. There's like, you know, smoked pigs hanging in the airport, you know? And that was so that folks who were being suspected of fake conversions would be forced to eat pork in public and show that they really had converted. So you see that today in Spain, both of those, the monument to January 2nd, together with October 12th in 1492, and also all of the pork that's in Spanish food. I went to Granada in 2021 when the Zapatistas were in, uh, went to Europe. And um, they marched on Madrid on the 500 year anniversary of the taking of the Nochtitlan which was 1521. And before I joined them for that, I went to Granada to go see, uh, uh, you know, what Granada looks like today. And there's a lot of tourists that go to the, the beautiful castle called the Alhambra. And across the street, there's an old city and I'm, I'm standing on the, you know, walking in the old city. And I see one of those sandwich board signs that says, you know, museum, uh, museum of the Inquisition's torture methods go here. 
And so I went and I learned more about the Inquisition and was, was, um, uh, maybe I, I don't know. I was surprised and then not surprised that the torture methods that the Spanish use on us, Native peoples here, were the same. The burning of the books, of the, the Muslims' books, happened before they happened to us. Very famously, the Maya books were burnt. There are only four in existence today that are known. And so I realized that when Columbus and all the conquistadors forward came, they already had a worldview, one of ethnic cleansing, of forcing everyone to become one way. And if not, they were going to cleanse everyone away from those lands. So not able to even tolerate difference. And that the techniques that they use on us, they were already using on themselves, on each other. So enslavement, for example, and this is not to say there were not empires in the Americas. Of course, we know about empires in the Americas. It's just that the relationship to the conquered was very different. If an empire conquered another peoples, that empire still allowed those people to live their lives, to speak their language, to have their beliefs. They just had to pay tribute, which is why throughout the Americas there are so many different languages. It's not that we were isolated from each other. There was a lot of interaction, a lot of migration. If you follow the corn, you can see that as a testament to that. Corn, the, the, the birthplace of corn is in what's today called Mexico and Mesoamerica, but it's now throughout all of the Americas and it's through that migration and through that trade. And there's so many languages still in existence. Sadly, many of them have been extinguished because we've been forced to just speak one language, Spanish, <clears throat> and in, here in the United States and Canada, English, and in Brazil, Portuguese. And so there was this intolerance of difference that the Europeans brought to these lands where they or they've been trying to impose one way of being on everybody since 1492. And so I want to show then how that relates to borders. Soon after 1492, uh, October 12, 1492, the Portuguese who are uh, advanced navigators, they're already, you know, um, uh, uh, sailing around Africa to get to the Indian Ocean, they um, they get upset that it's the the Spanish, not yet called Spanish, but we'll call them Spanish uh, kingdoms, Castile or Spain, that they have discovered these lands, and so the Portuguese want in on it, and so they start to fight, and the Pope steps in because they're all Catholics, and the Catholics aren't supposed to fight. So the Pope steps in and with the Treaty of Tordesillas of 1494, only two years later, draws a line, this green solid line here ends up being the line that says, okay, Portugal, everything east of this line, you go invade. And by invade, the Pope meant convert everybody to Catholicism. And to the west, Spain, Castile, you invade. And which is why, like, if you notice this line cuts through what is modern day Brazil, Brazil speaks Portuguese and the West of Brazil speaks Spanish. And eventually, you know, they get to around the, the globe on the other side and another, another line has to be drawn, the Treaty of Saragossa. And um, the Philippines are actually supposed to be part of that what uh, Portuguese uh, dominion, but Spain transgresses and Spain colonizes the Philippines. What's important about this is that it inaugurates global linear thinking. It's the inauguration of cutting up the globe in lines for dominion, for control. And of course, 
Native peoples to these lands are not consulted. It's not about Native people to these lands. It's about how Europeans are going to divide the world to manage and to control territory. So here we get what it looks like with the Portuguese. The Portuguese uh, don't mostly settle. What they do is they conduct a lot of trade. So they have a lot of trading posts. And of course we see Brazil and Angola and Mozambique, very famously countries that uh, in Africa that fought for independence only, you know, in, in, in the lifetime of, of people still alive today. And then to the West, you have um, Spain and those territories. And what ends up happening here is that the Americas get divided into vice royalties, beginning with the vice royalty of New Spain, which becomes Mexico, the vice royalty of New Granada, which has Ecuador, Venezuela, Colombia, and then vice royalty of Peru, of Rio de la Plata, and the vice royalty of Brazil. So you start to see that these lines keep getting drawn and they are lines to delimit which Europeans are going to control which area. It's just contracts between Europeans. It is not anything to do with the realities on the ground and the people who live there. And eventually we start getting that internally to Europe. Europeans did not have maps of Europe the way that we know. Their maps were just like lists of names. And it's not until uh, 250 years ago that they start to unite as nation states. So you have the cutting up of the Americas and then what, what, what scholars call a colonial reflection, a cutting up of Europe itself. And famously, Italy and Germany are the last to unite. Uh, Germany in, in particular has an inferiority complex because by this time, you know, the Spanish, uh, by the 19th century, the Spanish and the Portuguese have kind of, they've fallen as empires because the British, the Dutch, the French, you know, rose up. Uh, and so what Germany does to try to gain imperial territories is it calls the Berlin Conference. And that's where they put up on the wall a map of Africa and start dividing Africa between themselves. And here you see the parts that go to France, the parts that go to England, Italy, Spain, Belgium, Germany, Portugal. And so this is the logic that ends up going out throughout the world and eventually become nation states. Here we have Cecil Rhodes, um, who the Rhodes Scholarship, Rhodes Fellows are named after the colonizer of Africa who has a left foot over in the Nile and uh, his right foot over in uh, what's Cape Town, South Africa, as if, you know, he's an owner. It's very much the the sensibility that European colonizers came with that they stand over the, the lands as if they are God looking at, at, the, at the land as if they're not in it uh, and that they are controlling it. So eventually we get that uh, in the Middle East, in the Eastern Mediterranean. The Ottoman Empire, um, had control of these lands and was strong at a time when Europeans are very weak. But by this time, the European imperial powers are strong and the, the Ottoman Empire is weak and is falling. And so World War I was really important in the history of Palestine because it's a moment where the Europeans, the French, the British, and the Russians get together in secret and start cutting up the lands here. And they do it in secret because on the ground, and if you heard about Lawrence of Arabia and that story, they're trying to organize the people on the ground to help them fight against the Ottoman Empire. And they're promising them their own self-determination. And so 
they can't let them know that they're actually in secret trying to figure out how these lands are going to be divided between the European powers. And I want to point out something here about um, what becomes Palestine. There is over Palestine, it's in like this red. And red means it's under British, French, and Russian. It's not just British. It's not just French. It's not just Russian. So the purple is French, what becomes Lebanon and Syria. And so today, Lebanese and Syrians speak French. Iraq ends up being Jordan and, and, and Iraq, and that's British. Uh, but Palestine is supposed to be like between the three. Uh, the Russians are up north, they get you know, Armenia. But notice that with Palestine, over on the coast, there is a little part on the ports of Haifa and Akka, where the British were going to rule. And the reason for that is because there were designs to build a pipeline from the Gulf, the Persian Gulf, to the Mediterranean, an energy pipeline, water pipelines, uh, that have not been built to this day, largely because the Palestinian resistance has not allowed it, um, but it's still in the designs. And actually Netanyahu um, on September 22nd, a couple of weeks before October 7th, was at the United Nations showing how removing Palestine from the map and, and putting Israel together with friendships, friendship treaties with Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and other parts of the other countries in the Gulf would create this pipeline finally. So here is where, you know, we get this logic of cutting up these lands that eventually become these states. I wanna just uh, go back a little bit and just show us where we're at. The Middle East and North Africa, these end up becoming the modern borders. Uh, this is circa 2000s. Again, these borders did not exist before. And you notice those straight lines. Those straight lines were made on the map. They weren't created by any realities on the ground. And just zooming in, this is what it was like with the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire didn't have those borders. The Ottoman Empire understood territory as including also the seas, the Black Sea, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Red Sea. And there's a lot to talk about you know, in terms of how those seas were really important stalwarts against um, European invasion and why, for example, the, um, there was a lot of salivation taking place among the European empires as to when the Ottoman Empire fell, where would those territories go? And you know, Napoleon had already been at around this time was already having designs to cut a canal, the Suez, it becomes later the Suez Canal between the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea, uh, hoping to fight Britain that way, of course, not by fighting the British, but by turning his warships to this area uh, so that then they could go over to India, which was a crown jewel of Britain at the time, and then take India from the British. So there's the, all of these wars that the Europeans were having, they were having not so much in Europe, they were having on the rest of the world, and in fact, Europe was creating itself at this time as a space for peace. International law was being invented, but it was international law that would provide guidelines for Europeans as to when they went to war with each other. So they had laws of wars, how to treat, you know, in a humanitarian way your captives. None of that had anything to do with non-Europe. Non-Europe was a free-for-all. It was where piracy was allowed, anything goes, lawlessness. And that has actually been uh, by design so that Europe could create itself as a space for peace. It exported out its problems to the rest of the world. It's violence. It knows that there's going to be violence. So it says, just not keep it here, just do it over there. And for a long time that held until of course, with the world wars, World War I and World War II, which are, call, are called world wars because they took place inside Europe. But we can argue that the first, that World War I was in 1492. 
but that's not the way it's discussed. It's discussed that world wars took place when it boomerangs back onto Europe, as you know, famously Aimé Césaire uh, from the, the Caribbean, a revolutionary uh, thinker, poet from the Caribbean said that the Holocaust was a boomerang back onto Europe because the things that Europeans did to us were now coming internally to Europe. So zooming on in, here's where Palestine is and Palestine gets these borders in 1923. They get cut up between the British and the French. My entire dissertation was to try to figure out how we even got these borders. Uh, I ended up having to read the Bible. I, I went in thinking this is not religious, this is just secular. And then it turns out that it's both. It, this is not, this is political and and, and spiritual and religious, and it's, and it's a lot of things. Uh, th these borders were cut up, were, were the shape of it was first uh, designed uh, like about a hundred years before by evangelical Christians from the United States and England who were reading the Hebrew Bible, which Christians call the Old Testament. They were reading it literally, particularly the book of Joshua, which is the book that talks about after the Hebrews uh, leave and they flee Egypt, flee captivity and, and servitude, enslavement in Egypt to go to the promised land. How do they get that promised land? They get it through genocide. That's the book of Joshua. They, they, they are asked to, by God, to kill every child, every goat, every person in the land of Canaan in order to have that land. And so they, and then, and then that book, very geographically depicts what that land is. And so these evangelicals come to what they call the Holy Land to try to map out the Holy Land, the promised land. And there's a lot more to say about how it got it shaped this way. The Holy Land to them was a lot more extensive that went over to more to the east to where Iraq is, to the river, the rivers Tigris and Euphrates. But because of realpolitik, this ends up being the borders of Palestine. And it's interesting because I didn't know that the Bible had previously not been read literally. It had previously been understood uh, metaphorically, allegorically, um, until around the 19th century when evangelicals wanted to use science, scientific cartography mapping to prove their version of Christianity true. And so that that's that literal interpretation that then continues to this day where a lot of evangelicals, Christian fundamentalists believe that because the Bible told the Israelites to genocide the Canaanites, that that means that they need to genocide the Palestinians today. And they also believe that in order to do that, that that needs to happen so that Jews could then go to Jerusalem and build their temple again that had been destroyed already twice. And then once they rebuild it, the uh, it will be the second coming of Christ. And then it will be judgment day. And everyone who is not a believer in Christ will go into a fiery hell, including Jews. It's this very um, twisted kind of um, alliance that exists between the state of Israel, which obviously does not believe in that interpretation of the rapture. Um, but still gets together with Christian Zionists who far outnumber Jewish Zionists, far outnumber uh, for support. And it's very anti-Semitic. And um, it's that apocalyptic, apocalyptic vision, actually, that Christopher Columbus had. He and Isabella both held it that everyone has to convert or be killed, which is why there was so much forced conversion on these lands. Uh, there was an inquisition here on these lands too, for when they believed that our ancestors were lying about having converted to Catholicism. And again, it's this imposition of one world, of one way of being on everybody with zero tolerance for other worlds. It's an active destruction 
of other worlds, other ways of being, other ways of, of understanding the cosmos of being, really. So we get here the borders of Palestine in 1923, which is exactly 100 years ago. And because there's so much anti-Semitism in Europe, and Europe has this tradition to not deal with its internal contradictions and instead export them out to others, this happened with the Inquisition in 1492, for example, where uh, people who were Jewish were told, well, you have to convert or you have to flee. And some of them ended up becoming the conquistadors. They ended up becoming the colonizers here on these lands in order to survive. And so a lot of our last names like Rodriguez, uh, Martinez, Calderon, I have a Calderon in my family, are Jewish, Spanish Jewish last names. And a lot of us don't know that. We just believe that they're Spanish. And so this happened too with, um, with the growth of capitalism in Europe, uh, with the dispossession of peasants from the lands and forcing them to become factory workers in the cities. There was a lot of resistance before that could happen. And now it seems natural, but there was a lot of resistance. And so people who were fighting for lands were told by the kingdoms, by those same governments that were oppressing them and taking their lands away from them, that, hey, look, there's a lot of lands over there in the new colonies. And so then they become the oppressors here and they're just trying to survive. And that's that's how difficult this is, right? Because it's people who are oppressed, who are just trying to survive and they're given an option to survive, but they need to oppress others. And so that's what we've been seeing throughout the globe for the last 500 years. And sadly, that's what we're seeing with the state of Israel. Instead of Europe really self-reflecting on why it's so anti-Semitic, why it hates Jews so much, why the Holocaust could even happen where 6 million Jews perish and nobody did anything. And in fact, turned Jews away when they tried to be safe, like in the United States. They end up exporting their problem out to Palestinians who had nothing to do with it. And sadly, because this is a question of Jewish liberation, we need to continue talking about how the question of Jewish liberation has not been resolved. Israel is not a resolution to it. Israel requires anti-Semitism to exist in order to legitimize its own existence. It is not interested in doing away with anti-Semitism because if, it, if, if there is no anti-Semitism, there's no need for the state of Israel. And so what we see here is that among so many different debates among Jews on how to resist, how to uh, get liberation from this oppression. There was a lot of different debates. Some of them were more like on the internationalist worker, workers, anti-capitalist um, orientation, such as the Bund in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. There is also the more Orthodox Jews that wanted to you know, continue building their and, and maintaining their autonomous communities and being different and insisting on it's okay to be different. And there's also other responses like Jews that sought to assimilate. This is actually really prominent in North America, reform Judaism, to not quote unquote, look like you're Jewish, just like look like you're white and not really tell anybody, but you still like just culturally still do your, you know, your holidays and stuff, but try to, you know, assimilation for a lot of us is understood as a survival tactic, but what ends up, what it ends up doing, it's assimilating into the, uh, into the above, assimilating into whiteness, assimilating into the system that continues to keep crushing others that you're now different from. So sadly, like so many immigrants to this country have become white, like Poles, like Italians, like Irish, like Jews, and increasingly more like Latinos who wish to be white, they have to be, they have to separate themselves from Black people. They need to be anti-Black in order to do that because white supremacy's uh, opposite pole is anti-Blackness. 
And for a lot of us who are not phenotypically white, we're given the option to, well, at least don't be black and kind of like live like in that middle realm between whiteness and blackness. And it just, it doesn't do anything to undo that system. It perpetuates it, it reinforces it by our participation into it. And what needs to happen is that we refuse it, that we go create another way. And, you know, the Zapatistas and a lot of other movements, uh, but, but they're probably the most famous for this, have talked about how the problem is this above below dualism, where everything is about competition, you have to rank each other above and below. And what we need to do is be side by side along difference, but we can talk more about that um, in a little bit. But I wanna show then what, what how Europe exports its problem of anti-Semitism out to Palestine. In 1947, the United Nations, the newly created United Nations, which is this, uh, the, the, you know, the, the nations that have been created as an answer to decolonization, but really been integrated into empire as nation states, decide to partition Palestine to create an Arab state in yellow, a Jewish state in orange, and then the international zone in purple. And the international zone is where Jerusalem and Bethlehem are. Jerusalem and Bethlehem, very important to the, especially Jerusalem, the creation stories for all three Abrahamic faiths. And so by what they meant by international zone was not unlike how they meant between the Russians and the French and the British back when they were cutting up the maps, you know, during World War, World War I. By international, they mean those above. They don't actually mean everybody. They mean those allowed in the realm of having states where they could agree on borders and control the territories there. And of course, the native population in Palestine, many of them Jewish, many of them living there for millennia, who then converted to Christianity, then Christ converted to Islam, uh, refuse. And so they go to war together with the backing of the neighboring Arab states that were just created. And what happens is that the state of Israel is created, but no, and obviously no Palestine, what happens is that three quarters of a million of the native population in Palestine flees uh, the terrors of war and becomes refugees because Israel does not allow them to return because what Israel has wanted to be since the beginning is a Jewish majority state and they call it a demographic miracle that there are now not, not that many Muslims or Christians left and they wanna fill up the state with Jews. And because so many Jews from Europe had been killed in the Holocaust, they are upset about having to recruit Jews from Iraq, from Iran, from Morocco, from other parts of, you know, who are Arab and speak Arabic. Um, and they're very racist against them. They call them undesirable human material, but believe that because they're Jewish, they could be assimilated in. And even today in Israel, there's a lot of social stratification on phenotype where blonde and blue eyed Jews are at their hierarchy, like in the United States. And then there's a more Arab phenotypically brown Jews and then phenotypically black African Jews are at the very bottom. And there's a lot of contradictions there. There was a Black Panther Party that was created in the 70s by the, the Jews who came from Arab countries. Um, to show the world how they were discriminated against. Sadly, they have now become very right wing. Uh, and what brings them together is their manufactured hatred for the Palestinians. That's what keeps Israel together. If there wasn't an external enemy, it would fall apart. And so it's kind of like what we saw in 9-11 here that everyone who had been critiquing George W. Bush's administration, like stop doing that and the country kind of came together uh, because it was now like this external enemy. So what happens is that Palestinians who uh, were living on the coast flee to Gaza City and then get pinned in to the Gaza Strip. Uh, others 
flee to what becomes the West Bank and there are refugee camps there still in the West Bank. There's also refugee camps in Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon. And another war two decades later takes place, uh, the Six Day War, where Israel takes more land, controls now the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, Egypt's Sinai Peninsula, and the Golan Heights from Syria, which is still colonized and very few people talk about it. They talk about it as if it's just Palestine, Israel. Um, but the Sinai Peninsula is returned to Egypt uh, for uh, to in exchange for neutralizing Egypt from, from battling together with the Palestinians. So ever since then, Egypt has become the second largest recipient of aid from the United States. Israel is the first. And the and Gaza and the West Bank and the Golan Heights, Israel immediately starts to create settlements, um, Jewish settlements, where again, Jews are just trying to live their lives. And they're also being told that the Palestinians there are invaders, that this isn't their land, that the land was empty. Like there's a lot of this mythology that makes people believe this. And so they want to fight, you know, for what they believe to be their land and their right. And that against these so-called invaders, or even if they don't believe that they were invaders, there's a lot of racism that they've been taught about how they're not even human, as we heard uh, Netanyahu call Palestinians a couple of weeks back. They're human animals, which all of us, by the way, are animals. We're in the animal kingdom. What makes an animal is that we have to eat. We don't make our food like plants. That's the difference. Um, but Europe has in its cosmovision this idea that humans are, are are separate than non-humans and superior to non-humans. And so whenever we, we hear that language, don't act like an animal, you know, it's this, it's this uh uh reproduction of this idea that humans are not animals, humans are not part of nature, humans are superior to nature. And it's very, very common in Western philosophy. So what we get, you know, in the next decade is a, a Palestinian uprising in the West Bank and Gaza that embarrasses Israel. This is 1987 through 1993 that then creates this peace process where there's going to be a two-state solution. But there is no way to create a, a state uh, because Israel refused to remove its settlements, particularly from the West Bank. It removed its settlements from Gaza in 2005, but then moved them over to the West Bank and then made it easier for them to carpet bomb Gaza ever since without the fear that Israel would be hurting Jews. And now what we see, this is where we get like these maps of disappearing Palestine, um, 2005 forward. Um, you get a lot of like the, the green areas which are supposed to be a Palestinian state, less and less than them. They're not conjoined, they are surrounded. The, the outlines of what a Palestinian state would look like anyway would be that there's no Palestinian military. Israel would completely be in control of security questions. There'd be no Jerusalem for Palestine. They wouldn't control the water. They wouldn't control the air. Uh, and the, of course, the refugees would not come back, which is why it's always been such a contentious issue, this two-state solution, because it means that the refugees will not come back. So what we see important to know about the Gaza Strip and the West Bank is that they are two different models of Palestinian response. Hamas uh, in 1987 was created as a way to counter the Palestinian leadership, which already was, was on its way to say that they wanted a two-state solution. They formally said it in 1988, but was already on its way to do that. And Gaza is largely refugees. And not just Gaza, but so many refugees refused it. So Gaza is a Palestinian response against the two-state solution and against renouncing armed struggle. And the West Bank, the way that it's been governed by the Palestinian leadership there is by creating a Palestinian police called the Palestinian Authority, the PA, that wants to prove to the world that it can police its own people. So it polices Palestinians on behalf of Israel to show, look, we can, we can be partners 
in controlling territory, which is what states do. And what it what has happened is that in either case, nothing has worked for the Palestinians, even though they've tried so many different models. And we can talk more about Palestinian resistance. Um, I'll just go really fast over through my dissertation later, like started to, to like look at how the map was being used because this is obviously a colonizer map, but reappropriated by the colonized as a symbol for resistance because everyone, even though these were colonizers borders, that doesn't mean that there wasn't a reality on the ground that the people within that territory felt. Every single person inside the territory carved up by the British and the French that became modern Palestine uh, were to be dispossessed, every single one. And that's that wasn't necessarily the case with the neighboring countries. And so there you see armed struggle. This is from the 60s, a poster from the 60s. You have women and children. So it's like this, this, this broad struggle for Palestine. In the party logos, you see the map as well. The bottom one is from the PFLP, the Marxist, um, the Popular Front for Liberation of Palestine. The top is for Fatah, which is the Yasser Arafat. Um, yes, they're a, a more conservative uh, uh, party. And it also has the map. And in the front, it has um, armed struggle uh, iconography. Yasser Arafat, who was the leader of the Palestinians until his death in uh, 2004, uh, used to wear his kafia as like a, a map of Palestine. It was very very um, unique way of wearing the kafia. And this map in 1988, this was uh, the first map of Palestine created by Palestinians that I could find. It was published in 1988. It had taken three years, to, uh, five years to create. And in the, in the legend, you see that these were Palestinian villages that were abandoned and then it called them Jewish settlements. And the map makers of this map told me that after 1988, when the Palestinian leadership, Yasser Arafat, and then said that it was gonna be a two-state solution, they stopped mapping all of Palestine <clears throat> and just started mapping the West Bank and Gaza. This is the peace processes maps. Um, and again, we get to then these maps. Um, and, you know, we still like with Google Earth, here's a refugee counter cartography. When Google Earth came out, Palestinians started to pin on Google Earth the villages that they had been displaced from. And it caused a lot of ruckus uh, because the Palestinian leadership no longer maps in that area, uh, which is now Israel or what we call Palest uh, the land, Palestine, 1948 Palestine. Um, but it caused a lot more, um, it, it was a, a, a greater resistance map that allowed the world to see more about the Palestinian deeper history uh, about their own dispossession than anything that the Palestinian leadership would create. And then these are, uh, this is a map of a refugee camp that I was asked by the refugees to create. We got this aerial photograph. A lot of people think that refugee camps have tents and they did in the beginning, but these refugee camps are 75 years old. And so now they have buildings and they're crowded. And th in this one in particular, this is Ida refugee camp. Uh, this line is the apartheid wall with sniper towers. And here you can see from the roof of the camp what that looks like and that olive orchard uh, that Palestinians in the camp used to go to. Now they've been cut off from it. Jerusalem is in the north. And on the top here, you can see a settlement. And so uh, here's the camp, here's the outlines. Uh, I was working on this map with one of my compas there. And I asked him, hey, you know, like, are these streets correct? You know the streets more than any cartographer would from above. Like there's deep alleys and, and nooks and crannies. And he looked at it and I said, yeah, but you know, the rooftops are also streets. Whenever we're on curfew, we have to jump, you know, roof to roof. And so he, he drew the map of how he would jump in the second intifada when they were under, under curfew to get food across uh, to each other. And then, you know, throughout the camps, you see maps like this. You do not see any map that only has Gaza and the West Bank. You see the entire map of modern Palestine. And these are all the names of the villages that 
the refugees in, in Ida camp are from. And then there's more maps there. And I made a map, a map of maps in the camp of the graffiti of, of where the map shows up. And yeah, I mean, there's there's others, but you know, I'm happy to, to pause there just for conversation because we've already gone an hour. I don't know if y'all have any thoughts or questions, but there's a lot more that we can talk about if you like. I would love to jump in if I could. Um, I just uh, thank you so much. That was really informative. And I perked up when you said you're a geographer. So um, <laughs> um, I've been getting so much from critical geography in my, my readings uh, in this program. And it reminded me recently I watched um, a program from Al Jazeera with um, the Israeli architect um, Eisel Weissman about the um, the architecture of occupation. And um, when you were talking about Gaza being um, being free of Israelis so they can carpet bomb at will, and thinking of Weissman's um, depiction of settlements having strict building codes to have red roofs in order to signal to the Air Force not to bomb um, those certain houses was just um, chilling. And then seeing those walls and those um, um, those last few pictures, I was thinking of um, even the, the way they build roads through Palestinian um, uh, land in order to cut off grazing for livestock or movement of people and contain to in, in a sense contain um, not just the human population, but the non-human population as well. Um, and um, I was fascinated and um, by the counter mapping uh, from Google Earth, and um, which reminded me also of, um, I'm not sure if you know of um, mapliberation.org. I'm, uh, I'm joining from, uh, from Boston and um, there's a, uh, a group out of Boston that has been mapping um, Israeli involvement in, in Israeli funding um, and funding of, of Israel as well throughout Massachusetts. And so you see pretty much the entirety of Massachusetts just lit up with all these different organizations, especially police forces um, and um, edu you know, even uh, educational institutions and um, in a way to just kind of map the funding of the state of Israel and um, the consistent uh, genocide. Um, and of course they got pushback and they, they were um, called you know, anti-Semitic um, and they tried to shut them down many times. I'm surprised that it's still up there, but it is, um, it's a fascinating resource to see just how much our country, um, I'm, as, from my geography, um, it is, um, is caught up in the same mapping project of Israel and the disappearing map of Palestine. Um, so I, I just wanted to bring those points up and, and again, express gratitude for um, uh, what you brought for us today. Thank you for that. And, and yeah, thank you for bringing up Eyal Weizmann, um, who for me, gave me some conceptual clarity on, on borders. I followed the, the negotiations between Israelis and Palestinians and on the Palestinian side, the leadership would tell the Israelis, just give me the border, it will solve everything. And actually Israel is, a, I don't know of any other country that has not defined its borders. Israel will not define its borders because it's still you know, expanding. And what I argue is Israel already has its borders. A.L. Weitzman talks about how in, in an earlier book, Hollow Land talked about how in the West Bank, for example, there is a reality where settlers have their own roads and their own bridges. And it's kind of like this warming, uh, two realities warming so that they don't have to see each other. And 
there's actually a map that I'd like to show from Subjective Atlas of Palestine, this book here. Um, this came out in 2007 and it has a lot of like artistic renderings of maps, um, you know, like, like this one, for example. And this one's my favorite. I've just like people playing games from above. This one here reminds me of A.L. Weitzman where you have like this, 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 this overlapping, you know, uh, realities of above and below. And that's what I argue, the border between Israel and Palestine already exists according to Israel and not just Israel, to the West. And that is the line between the above and the below, the human and the non-human, which is why you know, they, they can call folks terrorists because they're not in the human realm. Palestinians believe that they could be above with Israelis as equal sovereigns, how like, you know, we were talking about um, with the with the, with the the Treaty of Tordesillas, for example, and then the vice royalties and the cutting up, those are agreements between the above. Those are called amity lines, friendship lines, those borders. The enmity line is that line between the human and the non-human, the Europe, the European and the non-European. And my argument is that that's the border between Israel and Palestine. It's not one that is on a map. It's one that exists as an ontology, an ontological reality, right? Of like what makes a person a person and what doesn't make a person a person. And we see it in the architecture all of the time, particularly in the West Bank, just like how this rendering of this map is. Thank you for map liberation. I didn't, I hadn't heard of it. It's so exciting. Because I haven't, I, I mean, I, the last time I was in Palestine was in 2013. I left academia in 2014. I was a Palestine scholar and I wanted to come back to organize my hood, which is what I've been doing more like underground, midground. When Tadigal asks me to come up midground, I'll come up midground, you know. But um, it's so exciting to see so much has been done since because back then there wasn't that much, especially when I first started after 9-11, it was really difficult to talk about this because you, you know, you get the label as a terrorist sympathizer or whatever. And now seeing people getting labeled that and they're like, I don't care what you call me, you know? And then there's all of this work that's been done. And it's really, and, and also seeing how Jewish Voice for Peace and a lot of Jewish liberation movements have grown in leaps and bounds since to say not in our name, we need something else. And so this is a, a really important moment, I feel like, for us to create that something else and not just for Israel-Palestine, but for the rest of the world, because this is a land back question and we here are in the United States on a settler colony. And exactly as you're saying, like the disappearing map of Palestine looks a lot like the disappearing map of Native America in what is now the United States. And without that realization, and this is something that is some, we, we all need to do that work and figuring out how we're going to share the world together. I don't think that's a question that's asked enough. How are we going to share the world with our difference? Not share the world and all be the same, but share the world with all of our differences. This what the Zapatista call for a world where many worlds fit. It's something that's all up to us. It's not just for Palestinians or Jews or Muslims and Jews to take care of. Um, I have a question in a direct message. When I stated, when you stated the assimilation of North American Jewish community and the reformed Jewish community, a lot of the times when people discuss whiteness and Jewish population of American Jews comes from the Ashkenazi presentation and ignores the estimated 25 to 20% of Jews of color, Sephardic, which is from Spain, Black Jews from Africa, Mizrahi, which are like Eastern, an, an interesting book is, yes, I read that book, When when Jews Became White Folks. Yes, this is a, a part of the canon of whiteness studies. Um, there's also like how the Irish became white. You know, there, there needs to be written more about this. And, and also what needs to be said is how Arabs used to be white and fought to be white, Arab Americans fought to be classified as white because before the Civil Rights Act, that actually like meant something. It meant you couldn't be discriminated against for a, for a variety of things. 
And sadly, the way that they became categorized as white is by concretely, Syrians were being lynched in the South and their argument was, we shouldn't be lynched, we're not black. Which means that they were okay with lynching black people, but didn't want to be considered, you know, the deserving of to be lynched, which is sadly like the logic a lot of us are placed in. Empire's worldview is very is closed. There's the above and the below, there's whiteness and blackness, and in between, there's and it's also patriarchy's logic, male and non-male. It's the logic of citizen of the nation state, citizen, non-citizen, like anything that's different has to be ranked in a superior, inferior. And if we don't get out of that, then we're going to want to assimilate into what's in, what's superior, and we're going to maintain the foundation of the inferior that we make our lives on. And so it's really interesting to see, and I think we need to say it more, but it can be a very sensitive topic with Arab Americans, I think because there's so much of a focus on identity and not on also power, that after 9-11, Arab Americans lost their whiteness, like in the popular imagination, like almost like instantly, you know? And when I was first getting involved in Palestine solidarity, I was raised by a lot of Arab Americans that, and then we immediately reached a limit because there was a lot of hesitation to connect with black and indigenous struggles because, you know, in trying to get your whiteness, you're not trying to be down there with the below, you know? Uh, but then the younger generation, I think because they've always been racialized since 9-11, have a lot easier time with that, with, with connecting, being more radical with other struggles and talking about that. And if we can't talk about how whiteness is not just, it's like secondarily a phenotype, what it really is, is this structure of power of who's deserving and who's not deserving, of who gets to live and make their lives off the backs of whom else, then we're not gonna see how it's dynamic. And we're also not gonna recognize why Israel exists in the force that it does and why there is so much trauma with a lot of Jews who've been made to believe that Israel is a safe space for them because it has such a, an enormous military power. Well, it's true. If we can only conceive of a world of above and below, it's going to make sense that a lot of Jewish people are going to want to support Israel because what else is there outside of that, right? There isn't really an imagination that there could be another way. And that's like our task is to model and create, to create and model that other way wherever it is that we are. Because other, otherwise, it's just only going to make sense for Jews who support Israel to maintain Israel because you can always fall down to the below and then go back to the Holocaust, go back to death and destruction, if we contain ourselves into that closed system of empire. So it's a very fear-based system. It's a very fear-based world that if we're not going above, we're gonna fall to the below. And the below is not this just romantic place of struggle and creativity, although it is that, it's also the place of death and destruction, right? So how do we move out of that? We can take a lot of lessons from runaway enslaved Africans in this hemisphere and how they ran away. Uh, recognizing, for example, the master slave dialectic that the West is based off of understands that two consciousness that, consciousnesses that meet are always going to have to be either the master or the slave. And you're gonna always wanna like, you know, overturn which one's on top and which one's on bottom. But if the enslaved runs away, the master just is no longer a master. The master is just a person. As long as people are, are committed to maintaining the position of master, they're gonna wanna get the slave back. They're gonna need the slave for the foundation of their own identity as master. The only way decolonization can be nonviolent is if the above decides it wants to no longer be above. And that, you know, to imagine concretely how that plays out, like how can we make that happen? Because otherwise it is going to be violent because enslaved runs away, but is always going to want to be captured back. And that's where resistance takes place, which is why to me, like this question of, do you condemn the Palestinian resistance or condemning any resistance to me doesn't make any sense. It's like, 
I condemn the context that makes that possible, the context of oppression that's going to cause resistance. Cause to me, that's kind of like condemning physics, like condemning the, it doesn't, you know, condemn the context that causes that because you should expect resistance. And if you're not gonna expect resistance, that, that then that is asking people to no longer have dignity, that is asking people to be okay with servitude, with enslavement, with their own annihilation. And we shouldn't ask that, you know, of anyone. And I think it's at the level of these ethical questions that we need to be at, our political ethical questions. We might call it philosophy, we might call it metaphysics, spirituality, ideology, you know, however it is that we understand the way that the world is and should be and how we want to be and relate to each other. Those are the kinds of conversations that are needed. And whatever it is that we're going to call it, I think that there, then our task is to figure out how can we make it so that we can just be side by side and with our difference. And this is something that we learned from the Zapatista women when they talk about their struggle against patriarchy. It's not a struggle against the men. It's a, it's a struggle against the system of patriarchy that places the male above superior to the non-male. That's the problem. It's not about doing away with the people above. It's about doing away with the system that creates us in those positions or puts us in those positions. Isra, you have a, we'll go to Isra and then Phil. Hi, thank you very much um, for your, um, how do I say this, like perfect uh, visual <laughs> illustration. Um, I guess I'm trying to fit an abstract concept within the borders uh, that you spoke of, um, which basically has to do with kind of like a push-pull between visibility and invisibility. Just like uh, when you're aware of borders, you speak of them, and then, you know, when you're trying to um, fight against them, then you are aware <laughs> that they're actually visible. Uh, the thing about Arab Americans um, that I think um, is very interesting that prior to 9-11, the majority, um, not this is a statistic that not many people know, but the majority of Arab Americans are actually Christian Americans. Mm -hmm. And the majority of Muslim Americans are non-Arab Americans. Uh, the, uh, this, uh, you, uh, you refer to the Syrian population in the South. Um, they um, basically were part of an immigration wave to the United States from back then only Syria that actually geographically encompasses both Syria and Lebanon in the 1800. And their status as white was granted to them because the conceptualization of Christianity and inviting, you know, non-European Christians into the Americas had everything to do with the fact that well, these are Middle Eastern, these are the people of Christ, and Christ, no matter what, has to be white in an American context. Mm. So that whiteness was given to them. And then it was justified when the Italians were being considered white and when um, Mediterraneans in general were being considered white because um, of the close geographical proximity between these two populations. And also um, the fact that um, the Syrians in the South had whatever standing that they had to not be considered, you know, lynching material had to do with the fact that they benefited uh, from the, um, I forgot the name, the alien land laws that were in the South, which, may, which deterred um, the, Asian and non-desirable immigrants as they prescribe them from actually owning land in the South. So again, when you are as a as an American are integrated into this idea of becoming an American, you kind of just like consume all of these like citizenship and identity demarcation that are presented to you. Um, the census up until today, up until this day, recognizes Arab Americans at, uh, and Middle Eastern non-Arab Americans as white. Therefore, they cannot qualify for affirmative action. They cannot qualify for a lot of uh, quotas and everything that is considered um, 
um, you know, um, a, co a corrective measure to people of color. And therefore, it's since the Obama campaign that a lot of Arabs were saying, we want our ethnicity, we want to be able to check Middle Eastern as opposed to lumping us together with white. And also um, the Middle Eastern identity that speaks of Arab Northern American and um, Jewish Ashkenazis, it's really to force a Middle Eastern ethnicity on Ashkenazi Jews that some of them, obviously not all of them, but some of them are actually converts to Judaism. So then you have the whole question of conversion, which is by assuming a religion, I assume the, um, you know, it would be like a Bay Area white convert to Sikhism squatting in Amritsar in Punjab where the Sikh golden temple is and saying, I am Punjabi because I, I converted to Sikhi. Um, and I guess um, that that is basically a tension that an Arab American and a Muslim American such myself have to contend with when we're trying to talk with a broader um, um, audience for this topic. So I really would appreciate your take on how can we make a clear illustration of these concepts the way that you succeeded in making your geographical one. And I'm so sorry for taking a long time. <laughs> Ooh, I, I wanted to, I can't do the reaction of this, but I want to just applaud you because, um, and just so much, so, so much gratitude right now for this moment, because I have not been able to have an advanced conversation about this until this moment. Um, that is such a great point. I hadn't thought about that. There is the, the quote unquote menace of Islam in the US imagination. And that, I mean, we don't talk about Christian fundamentalism in this country. The, the first Christian fundamentalist on these lands, the first Christian was a fundamentalist, sadly, was Columbus, you know, but what, what is called fundamentalist is Islam, or sometimes like, sometimes Judaism, but not really, it's really Islam. And so I think that that is such an important point is that the, yes, um, the, the question of worlds, again, right? The imposing of the one world world is a Christian, a very specific kind of Christian world because there's many different kinds of Christianity, but the one that empire co-opted, right? Uh, I, I'm going to have to think about that. And I'd love to maintain, if you want to maintain in touch about this, because it's so exciting to me. We need These are the kinds of conversations that we need to have um, that understand power and not just identity, that understand that there is a context of this positionality of identities that sorts identities. Because if we just begin with identity, we're going to fall into the trap of believing that there is an identity that is always and in every in, in every time and every place an oppressor or in every time and every place the oppressed. And that's not the case um, because they can shift. Like what we see, like to be Jewish in Germany is to be below, but to be Jewish in Palestine is to be above, right? So the idea that the eternal oppressed um, is a Jew, for example, does not make sense. And that's because we're not taught to read as power. So I'm going to, I'm going to think about what you said and please, we could be in touch um, because these are precisely those conversations we need to have and the analyses that we need to build, the conceptual curanderismo, the conceptual healing that we need for moment, for this moment right now. So I just want to just, I just, again, gratitude. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to, I don't know, Phil, if you still have a, a thought, but your hand is down. And then we'll go to Sudha. Hey, yeah, I love the presentation a lot. Um, I have a couple of critical comments. I don't think I'm going to make many friends by them, but I think that's important to bring them up nonetheless. Um, first off, I, um, I question whiteness of Jews, even Ashkenazim. Because I think as long as there are people with anti-Jewish racism, Jews are going to be racialized, bisexual, racist, and targeted accordingly. 
And I think like one of the ways that that can work sometimes is like you can live in a society where um, most part there won't be anti-Jewish racism, that's that virulence. But once those um, racists emerge, then that is a thing that exists according to their perception of them and how they're going to be treated. And I think this it is a global issue. It also has local manifestations. And even in like more progressive strongholds, if you will, to use the word progressive with scare quotes, that's a scary word, because <laughs> who knows what the hell that means. It's certainly not my politics, but I, I'm meaning that in the sense of, you know, culturally progressive, even in certainly culturally progressive strongholds, you might be surrounded by like virulent white nationalists. Like I'm in a place, Olympia, Washington, that's actually, you know, um, pretty cozy for the most part in regards to, you um, these issues, except right on the outskirts, there's tons of white supremacists, et cetera. And it, you know, becomes, it becomes very messy there. Um, and then I want to preface the rest of what I'm going to say with something to just context where I'm coming from. I'm a non-Zionist. I was in Palestine movements for over 10 years. And I had to leave the movement because of disagreements with politics that I was finding pretty consistently. I'm a no-stater. I'm an anti-nationalist. Um, I'm in favor of something like Rojava for Israel-Palestine. Um, I, uh, you know, I agree with like everything Chomsky says critiquing Israel. Like I agree with basically like 95% of his critiques of Israel. So I'm prefacing everything I'm saying with that, just so people know where I'm coming from. I do think it's very important that movements critique the hell out of Hamas. Um, I think they're a military dictatorship, a theocracy and anti-Semitic government. And I think a failure of movements to critique Hamas actually destroys the very egalitarian ethos of movements um, in favor of selectively supporting some authoritarian powers against others based off of which one is more oppressed or not. And I don't think that's the way I do politics. I want to come at this from an internationalist perspective that is critiquing authoritarianism everywhere, even while acknowledging those power imbalances and asymmetry and all of that as well. It's just, I think this is an important part of the puzzle piece. And in fact, like this is why I've been driven out of movements is precisely the failure to do this. And I say this because SJP, um, PYM, PSL, ANSWER, Workers World Party, Pal Action US, all of these groups have come out supporting the Simchat Torah massacre of a thousand plus Jewish civilians as some kind of liberation. And I don't work with those groups on principle. I'll never work with a group that does that unless they apologize and change course. Um, and I'm not the only one. I think it's ethically bankrupt. And I think strategically, it just destroys movements. And it allows the right wing to make certain attacks on those movements that are not just, they they, they might be smears, but they can then base it off of these um, truths. And like we see SJP right now being targeted by the state in a very specific way. Um, and it's not completely based off of nonsense. Like 20 to 30 plus chapters came out supporting the Hamas massacre of Jewish civilians as some kind of liberatory move. When it's not liberatory, it's just a, an increased escalation and it's not gonna lead to Palestinian freedom at all. It's like, in fact, like it, it, the, it, even though this was a terrible day for those innocent civilian Jews, it's obviously like gonna kill even more Palestinian civilians and it's already done that. Um, and it's just gonna, I don't think that was the least bit liberatory. People have you know, compared it to, to John Brown and all sorts of absurd analogies. I don't think any of that's helpful to the movement. In fact, I think it like it literally has driven me away and I'm not the only one. Um, and I'll just leave it there for comments and critiques. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, I will. I'll engage, but anyone else and anyone else, please. Yeah. So on the first thing about Jews as and whiteness, whiteness is not static and not and no and no identity is static. The the positions of above and below are constantly changing. So for example, context isn't just the nation state, context is the moment, the conjunctures, everything that we find ourselves in. So, and I'll use myself as an example, vis-a-vis -a, -vis a white woman, me as a native woman, a brown woman, I'm below. I'm not as believable, I'm not as trustworthy, You know, I'm not as human, I'm not as desirable, but vis-a-vis -a, -vis a black woman, I'm above. Right. Like that is the way that context works. Context shifts within an instant. And that is the problem. The problem then is that context of having to rank each other and ourselves as superior and inferior and others. Right. So context is really important. And it's important that context can shift shifts it in an instant. So to say that Jews 
and become white. It's true, but not vis-a-vis like a wasp kind of person. Um, for example, a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant person, but vis-a-vis Black people, vis-a-vis Brown people, then yes, that is true. Jews are, are, are placed above as white vis-a-vis others. So it's a context shift that happens in an instant and as, 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 as often as context changes, which is all of the time. And that's why to talk about identity as static doesn't make sense. Um, what makes sense to me is to talk about the problem with a context that even shifts us there over and over and over where we're stuck in this cycle always. How do we get out of that is for me the liberatory question. The question of Hamas as liberatory, to me, I, I leave that up to Palestinians themselves to decide, but also folks who've been part of the movement to decide. Like, I have my critiques of Hamas. I've had my critiques of Hamas for a long time because I'm an, I'm an I don't call myself an anarchist, but I Palestine Israel made me for the first time be like, whoa, I think the nation state's a problem. You know, then I started seeing it everywhere else. And Hamas, from what I under, from how I understand them, they're not in, they're not interesting. They're not interesting to me as a liberatory movement. They are looking for a state. They're looking for, in a way, like a they're like a mirror of Israel, like a Muslim state uh, vis-a-vis a Jewish state. And they have they continue the above and the below which is actually not different from most movements that we're around. Like to me, the Zapatistas are a beautiful movement because they are trying something very, very different. I don't know what movements in the United States, how many are trying to get out of the above and below. And that's why for me, Hamas is not interesting. In terms of John Brown analogies and to me, those analogies are not absurd. Like to sit with, with this question of the response that the below has to their own annihilation, like it's a very disturbing question for somebody who is not confronted in the face in that context of that annihilation. And I will just share two, uh, two weeks before October 7th, I, I received a phone call from the refugee camps in the West Bank who I work with. And I was I was actually scheduled to be in Palestine right now in November. So this was end of September, on September 23rd, the day after Netanyahu gave his speech, I received a distressing call from the camps who told me to go look at his maps um, where he had completely erased Palestine and was about to, you know, was talking about the peace uh, treaty with Saudi Arabia and building that pipeline that we saw with the Sykes-Picot agreement from 100 years ago, finally building that pipeline as, you know, this peaceful peaceful, peaceful solution, making it seem as if the Palestinians were the reason why there isn't peace in the region. And the compas there, the refugees told me, we're done. Once that happens, it's over. Um, and the way that things have been going on the ground we don't have that much time left. We've been struggling for 75 years. We think at the most we have two years. We're done. We're not even talking about how we're going to survive. We're talking about how we're going to fall and what we're going to leave for the next generation. They had talked about how a lot of the discourse was focused on the perfect Palestinian, the blonde and blue-eyed Palestinian, the nonviolent Palestinian, and that that's the only Palestinian that the West is willing to understand as deserving. And so then when October 7 happened, this was not the perfect Palestinian, but what has happened strategically, now the world's attention is on the Palestinians where they had been ignored over these last several years. Things had been getting really hot on the ground over the last two years in ways that we hadn't seen in like 20 years. And no one was paying attention anymore. It just seems so common and so natural. So in talking about resistance, there's also questions of strategy and tactics. And resistance movements always need to figure out, is this, this tactic going to make us stronger the next day or going to make us weaker the next day? And so that's something to think about in, 
and studying, observing what's been going on since October 7th, has the Palestinian struggle become stronger or become weaker in this moment? There is for sure, Phil, this question of proposals. This for me, Hamas is not a liberatory proposal either. And in fact, most Palestinians don't really support Hamas. They supported them in the beginning as an anti-corruption kind of um, alternative to what was happening in the West Bank. But increasingly started to see so much of you know, the patriarchy and a lot of the internal contradictions. So I think a reason why a lot of movements who support Palestine are also not adding to the critique of Hamas is that that is the mainstream critique of Hamas and that would add more fuel to that fire and distract from the bigger question of Palestinian liberation. Internally, for sure, among Palestinians, there's all kinds of debates. In terms of our solidarity, I do think that we need to have a view for what is liberatory, but for folks who are not part of movement struggling on the ground, it kind of feels like it's just like this, you know, this armchair kind of critique uh, that then might do more harm than good in, in distracting it. So I, I feel you, Phil, because I'm for sure, like, I don't organize in Palestine with any parties. I don't organize with most Palestinians. I organize with very specific Palestinians who are building autonomy. But in terms of the broader struggle, that for me is a just struggle for folks trying to shake off an oppressor. But actively me as part of the movement in community with Palestinians who are my kin, the way that I organize is toward liberation. And so for me, I can have critiques of struggle because I am part of the struggle. But for folks who are not part of a struggle, it feels like it does a lot more damage. And especially for folks who aren't shaking off settler colonialism here in the United States, it just feels like it's just talking about a struggle as if all of us, the rest of us aren't really implicated in it. I did see other hands, Sudha and then Michael. So I will please give you the mic. Thank you, Linda. Um, I'm gonna try and organize my thoughts because you've said so much and but I want to first thank you. I don't think I've heard such a complete presentation on the human condition as as what you have today and the 2000 year history. I hope you're going, we're gonna get a link to the recording. Um, we will, won't we? Yeah, so um, it, it, I have to watch it again and again. This is information I want to have at my fingertips. It's absolutely phenomenal. Um, a few of the things that I am not able to be scholarly at this moment, so I'm going to be personal and um, meaning my experiences and so on and how I'm uh, functioning in this uh, moment of horror that's happening uh, to Palestinians. So to Ga people in Gaza, I should say, uh, and the West Bank. So um, uh, let's see. Um, Okay, I'll just go with the way I have the notes here. So um, I, I have to preface this by saying I was raised by Zionist parents, Christian parents in India. And at that time, Indian Christians also hated the Muslims. For I won't go into that. So the division was because Hinduism at the time when I grew up, at least in the South, Hinduism was this very laid back, not really religion, no dogma kind of thing. And what we see now is Hindu fundamentalism, which has always been there because the Hindu American Foundation and um, the fundamentalist Hinduism from the United States actually supported and uh, funded the guy who assassinated Gandhi. So there's all of this. But um, now uh, when I went to India in June, I see how close Christians have become with the Muslim community because Christians are also being harassed and oppressed by the Hindu fund rise of Hindu fundamentalism under Modi. So the shifting of power that you talk about, yes, constantly, we have to keep an eye on that as scholars and as activists. There's always, and that's the intersectionality. So um, anyway, um, so that one, and then uh, what did I want to say? Uh, 
Oh, give me a moment. This is my head injury. I'm so sorry. I have to take up time. But I, I loved what the way you keep bringing back this that it's the system. We have to eliminate the top down system. And without that, because I was talking to this young person in India and he said, it seems like we're fighting for the oppressed to become the oppressor. And this was just a few months ago. The, I mean, well, um, uh, about the beginning of this year. And um, so the and and the stuff you said about patriarchy and matriarchy i was very against matriarchy because i see women women being equally capable of harassment as men and if you put them in power but then talia explained to me what matriarchy really means and and so so what, now when you explain patriarchy and or the situation around that in your presentation or or response to a question I thought that that makes total sense. So there's a lot of uh, people's positionalities based on lack of information, you see. And um, I myself had this position of, I, I, you know, what based on what I thought matriarchy was. But um, so uh, so how how do we get people to be in a in a process of learning and not emotions? Because as you said, nobody was talking about Palestinians for a while, and then all of a sudden the whole world is talking about it and um, based on a conflict. And then now nobody's talking about Ukraine and Russia. And uh, apparently I'm reading now in right wing media that um, they are, that the government U S is quietly telling Ukraine to end, end the conflict somehow to concede. In fact, they're being asked to concede to end this conflict. And uh, so I'm not saying they shouldn't concede because I have my own views on that whole conflict, but but the um the shifting of uh not shifting of I forgot now why I went to uh, oh yes this um w we are always led into into activism by our emotions and where we are and um uh, I also loved what Isra said uh, because it is true that um it seems that a lot of my interaction with Arab Americans has been now that I think about it Christian. Arabs in this country, but they were from um, uh, some of Palestine and some from Iraq. Uh, and uh, I found them extremely racist, um, uh, very elitist. And of course, they came from very rich families and are extremely wealthy here. So there's that there's the thing of elitism as well, uh, which informs our positionality on an issue. So um, and then the, the the last thing I want to say is the whole thing about the swastika. And it's blown up in my neighborhood in Palo Alto because some kids drew on, with chalk, some in outside a high school, the Indian swastika, which is left counterclockwise going. And, and Diwali is coming and we do make, uh, you know, the Star of David is also a sacred Indian, South Asian symbol, I should say, not Indian, South Asian symbol uh, of unity. And so is the swastika, which the Nazi Germans took and converted it into the racist swastika. So um, all of a sudden, Jews in my neighborhood are, oh, I'm so scared, I'm terrified, I'm this, that, and everything. So I stepped in and I said, wait a minute, you, there's a huge South Asian population here, and, and Diwali is coming, and this is drawn in chalk. That's what we do. We draw in rice, pow rice powder on the ground for, you know, the columns and, and, and the rangolis and whatnot. So can we please take a breath? And, and, and then everybody started, so Jewish neighbors started saying, uh, this is a stab in our heart for us to see the swastika. And I'm like, but this is not the Nazi swastika not insignia. This is our sacred symbols that were appropriated from us by Europeans. So can we not reclaim our sacred symbols back? And I'm not even religious. I'm not Hindu. I'm not, you know, I, 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 I detest religion of any sort. But here I am defending this symbol because I'm just so sick of of the elite always grabbing the narrative and taking it. And, you know, we are also a colonized culture. We were appropriated. So, so, um, so how do we get to that position of where the top dismantles itself? Is the question I'm going to leave you with. <laughs> I love that. I don't, that's the question. Yeah, because how do we do this without more bloodshed, right? Like, how do we all bloodshed is is a problem. I think that that that's why that's why we're here. Um, that's why we're talking about this. It's not that we want the blood of others and favor other other blood and not others. How does the above come down? Well, 
I I know of very very specific instances where th where this has happened, and they all entail the above willing to die the way that the below dies. And so an example that I use a lot is with the Zapatistas Subcomandante Marcos, who's a white man, you know, functionally white in Mexico, uh, goes with indigenous peoples and and organizes a liberation struggle with them and puts his body on the line. So for the Mexican state, he stops being white, you know, because he can be killed just like others can be killed. Rachel Corey, very famously, who tried to use her body to stop a bulldozer in Gaza in 2000, I think four, um, stopped being white, you know, the minute that she put her body on the line. So it it's something that, requires not just going below, but also creating another world that can sustain that. So it's not just death that people experience. It really is a whole new metaphysics of understanding each other, of being with each other. A lot of the time when we're taught about, you know, how we can have equal rights, for example, there's a standard that we have to meet. So for example, citizenship, you know, in order to have citizens rights, you need to speak the language or you need to have been born or you need to go file this paperwork. You need to have X kind of money, um, know the history of the country. There's a standard. The minute there's a standard introduced for equality, that means inequality has been introduced. This goes all the way to Aristotle, at least. The idea of sameness as, as, as what the political community is going to be, the citizenship, the citizen. Whereas like the Zapatista women say, we are equal because we're different. There is no sameness to aspire to. It's difference that's understood as like the, the power that we have as community. We're powerful because of our differences, not in spite of our differences, which is usually what we hear you know, in, in this context. So, and it's not just ideas. It also has to take place in the world. And I totally feel about emotions. I think emotions end up being important in that we need to feel that this other place really does make us feel dignified, makes us feel better. And, and I talk about this again, like my example is always going to be the Zapatistas, I feel like, just because when I'm in Zapatista territory, I say all the time, to, just to provoke people, you know, there aren't any white people in Zapatista territory. And then folks say, I see white people all the time in the photos. And I say, oh yeah, phenotypically white, like white adjective, yeah, but not white, I'm the boss. Like there's a whole different way of relating in Zapatista territory where anyone trying to come in quote unquote as white, meaning like, as I know everything, as I'm gonna tell everybody what to do, as I need to be the one that's heard, you know? Like that is not rewarded behavior at all. It gets kind of like looked at and then kind of like ignored. And then, you know, someone will go talk to that person and hey, like, hey, that's not how we really do things around here, you know? And if folks are humble enough, then they'll learn and they'll come back. But other folks who might not be humble and they're too arrogant to learn, they just won't come back, right? So it is this, this new feeling of being like, where you feel dignified, where you feel like you're not having to compete against everybody, you know, over whether you're worthy. Um, a friend told me, you know, Cuba is not the best example, but there is something about Cuba where there aren't billboards trying to sell you something and telling you how inadequate you are all the time that you need to buy something in order to reach a standard. You know, like there is a feeling to it, um, but those spaces need to be created in order to be understood as possible. Because the feeling that we have, I feel like at least the feeling I have in the dominant world is one where I'm just never adequate enough. And that 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 really is hurtful. And I think it hurts a lot of our self-esteem, it's our mental health, our physical, emotional, all of our health. And it's in those other spaces where I find is medicine. And that's why I do the work that I do in actively trying to create these other spaces, other community, other ways of being where we treat each other 
we, you know, we talk about what's your superpower? What's your superpower? You know, what's everyone's superpower is different. And how can we get together with everyone's superpowers and create something far bigger instead of trying to make everybody be the same as X person up there, you know? So there is a level of emotion to it, but that needs to be created um, in the material world so that it could be felt at the spiritual level too. And it doesn't just, just stay at the level of ideas. Hope, you know, the more that we can create these spaces, islands of sanity, someone called him in one of our classes, um, I think that it can allow folks to see and to feel that this is possible. That's what I needed. And that's what the Zapatistas did for me is I was able to, to feel it, not just see it, but to feel it in real life. Like, whoa, this is possible and it can be done out of nothing, out of almost nothing, you know, just with that will. And also with that, that other kind of guidance of understanding we're equal because we're different, not that we're inadequate until we're the same. Uh, but it does need a lot of consciousness to, to be built around, around a lot of this because is the master going to willingly come down and no longer want the slave like that's the huge question before us how can we how can we make this irresistible how do we make it so that it happens understanding too according to your context you need to see like if it's even possible in the in the context of israel palestine right now with israeli society how right wing and bloodthirsty they have been manufactured to become like that it doesn't really seem that Israelis are willing to come down and go out. That's why Jews who do it are really important uh, because they create this massive contradiction as if the state, you know, state of Israel is speaking for them. And they say, no, we're going to go do something else. And I think that that like creating those spaces and having those models in real life is really important. Yeah. And I'm sorry, just about the appropriation of symbols. That's really it's really hurtful and really violent. And I'm, I'm really sorry about that. And sadly, the context in the United States has become where um, that symbol is so overdetermined in a lot of spaces, largely because one, there isn't a lot of very good education in the United States by design. Uh, and part of that bad education is also sh uh, trying to point out that Germany is like that the that the Nazis were the worst offenders in the world, and that's strategic so that the United States doesn't have to point to itself. You know, there's a book called the uh, uh, American Holocaust came out in 1992. There's a whole industry that wants that word to be only used for the violence that Jews experienced under Nazi Germany and nobody else. The Museum of Tolerance, sadly, a really powerful museum. But at the end, you see that the answer is Jews from Europe going to on a boat to Palestine and then Israel being the answer and not wanting to include other genocides in the discussion, not want, allowing people to use that term even genocide, like fighting against it. And like, you know, this is very strategic so that the United States and other European powers don't have to take responsibility for what it is that they've done. So they use Germany as like the, the worst crime against humanity, like really the worst, like it's like the superlative to then, you know, hide everything else that, that happened. Thank you so much. I think Michael is next. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one of the things that I, I wanted to bring up, and and you did uh, in, in your last statement, is um, looking what well, what well, one of my major concerns is um, the youth and and how especially in Israel um, the youth have been uh, have become more rival. Uh, this is what I'm looking for. Radicalized by um and 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 been recruited by far right uh political parties. 
uh, was in Israel. And some of my background is uh, for many years, I worked with Israeli groups and, and language immersion programs and also other international students. And also I lived on the kibbutz for six months doing the OPAN program. And um, one of the things I saw over, you know, from 2000, 2010 was my first year to 2014, 15 was my last year, is slowly seeing um, Israeli youth uh, on the kibbutz and uh, youth that lived off the kibbutz being more, um, you know, drawn into a lot of these extreme right um, political parties within Israel and how, you know, a generation earlier, like we say, like 10 years earlier, more people were even thinking about like a two six states and how we can, how there can be peace. And to the re, you know, almost the whole rejection of it from a lot of students I was talking and working with. And when I talk about students, I mean 12 year olds to 16 year olds. So very young, young students. And what I also saw was, you know, within our country and, and, and with other countries that I've seen is, is this extremism is that what is now seen okay. Um, you know, within the society. Well, you know, what has kind of been culturally acceptable? And one of the things Israel, you know, you look at like what do Israel's, what do people go to? What do people participate in? And there's always been this extremely racist football group called uh, A Better Jerusalem. And they're always been known as the most racist football team in, in the world. And how Israeli politicians in like the last 10 years are been willing to be seen at those games or being willing to be seen at places where um, it wouldn't be socially acceptable or politically suicide for them to appear but they're now trying to carry that like trying to gain that support from that fan base from those youth um, and to identify with the politics of you know of of similar groups that think that way. And, you know, so I, I've, I've seen this slowly happen over 10 years has been very concerning for me. And then also the influx of, um, you know, in the last 20, 25 years, a Christian fundamentalists in the United States supporting the settler movement um, and other NGOs and, you know, to fulfill like the, the Armageddon theology of, you know, once we get more Jews into Israel, you know, Christ will return and this whole kind of Armageddon theology that they're pressing and why they're, fi uh, why they're funding um, settlements within Israel um, to accommodate their own theology. And so, you know, as I kind of look at that and then also look at some of the political things that have happened, you know, and how the, you know, the polit political sphere of Israel has become extremely right wing and the people that are currently in power have no, I mean, just looking at some of the things that some of them have said in the last two or three years before this, these are people that don't want a two-state solution, don't want to have a peace, you know, with the Palestinians, and I'm very concerned of like, okay, how is this going to end? But then also, how what has been what is being taught to the next generation? Because now I the, always the hope was like, oh, the next generation could help maybe move this process forward, and I don't see any hope in that at all. Just to see kind of what the this next generation has been taught, has been shown, has been recruited by, and um, you know, so my thing is kind of finding that kernel of hope of, you know, I don't have any faith in the leadership of on either side right now to just to, to kind of um, answer or deal with the problems and, and the, the issues that are um, are happening. But then I'm really concerned that the next generation, I 
don't know. I don't see, you know, any hope in that either because it's, you know, it's the party is like Israel's government is the most right as it has ever been. And there is no change in sight. Yeah, I want to echo that. Ten years ago, I, I also thought Israeli society was going to reject uh, the status quo, and it's gotten more right wing. And there's a lot there. I think that has to do with fear. Um, and again, I think that Israel itself, because it needs anti-Semitism in order for it to exist, wants to always point out that there's an anti-Semite behind every door, you know, you need the state, you know, even the discourse right now is, you know, Jews aren't safe anywhere, where else are they going to live? Like it adds onto that. So it is really worrisome. What I have some hope for, and I mean, it's it's not optimism, but at least it's hope, it's, a, it's an opening, is that Israel as a protector of Jews is no more. One, because of what happened on October 7, they weren't, a, they weren't able to protect Jews. And actually, a lot of the killings of Jews were by friendly fire, by Israelis themselves who were armed. And two, because it's very clear to me that the operation was really to get hostages to do a prisoner swap. I remember in the 2000s for years there was a drama of Gilad Shalit the Israeli soldier who had been kidnapped by the resistance in Gaza and for years there were negotiations to get Palestinian prisoners of war in exchange for that soldier and Palestinians were able to get 1027 Palestinians in exchange for one Israeli soldier so having 200 Israeli hostages could have freed all 4,000 Palestinians in Israel's prisons. Now there's 10,000. There's been more since October 7th. But what happened is that Israel immediately started to carpet bomb Gaza without caring about the hostages. Even the hostages are pissed at Netanyahu uh, because it's very clear Israel doesn't care about the hostages. It's just using this as an excuse to wipe out Palestinians. And so what this has done in the eye, in front of everybody, it has transformed Israel as an active killer of Jews. Not just can it not protect Jews, it's also killing Jews. So then what is Israel for if it wasn't to protect Jewish life? So an opening there is to point out that Israel is not a solution for Jewish liberation. There has to be something else. And I think within Israeli society, this is already being seen, like a lot of Israelis are even talking like, like they're fleeing Israel because they don't feel safe. The thing is, we need to create a world where all of us can feel safe. Otherwise, it's just going to keep on repeating. So I wanted to also just point to um, Phil. But before I do that, um, well, together with Phil, actually. So Phil has a lot more in, in the chat. Uh, and I think it's important to engage with it. I'm not calling for the perfect Palestinian Gandhi or pacifism. I'm calling for non-anti-Semitic, non-authoritarian, non-targeting civilians, non-theocratic resistance. I don't see any liberatory results from the Simchat Torah massacre. As for not critiquing Hamas, for that it can lend support to Israel. It is different, but reminiscent of not critiquing Stalin because it can fuel U.S.'s Cold War mission which led to the relativism of selectively supporting authoritarian powers on part of much of the global left. I agree, Phil, I agree. This is a huge, the authoritarian question is a huge problem, which is why I was saying like, what movement in the United States like isn't replicating the above and the below? I think that this is the medicine we need for all of our movements, which I think it was and is a disaster for the global left and actually informs the strange pro Hamas positions we're seeing from anarchists, socialists, communists, et cetera. And from major organizations in Palestine solidarity right now in the USA. Solidarity against the war slash occupation slash siege slash settlements, et cetera, and solidarity with Palestinian people should have been the approach as opposed to solidarity with Hamas. I think social movements really shot themselves in the foot via the pro Hamas 
Pro Simchat Torah Masa Krista on a qualitative level, it is an ethos and politics radically opposed to every reason I joined social movements. Parentheses, opposition to authoritarian violence, full stop, a criteria that one can use to radically critique Israel as well. And parents. I bring this up because I think the above is crucial to developing ethical and strategic movements. I'm with you on this question of authoritarianism. It's a huge problem. It's, I mean, within, within a lot of the left, this is again why this, I, I I really um feel in anyone like if if what you're looking for, the Zapatistas are doing. That's exactly what you just described. They did a more conceptual healing for a lot of us by splitting the left. They call it the left from above and the left from below, the authoritarian left and the non-authoritarian left. And they're the left from below. They, they say always from below and to the left. And it is to not replicate Stalinism or this idea that you know, all of our liberation movements have to have like this great man or this, you know, elite power up there. They really do believe in what I, I believe anarchists and, you know, the more uh, communalist um, movements believe in, in the power of everyday people to build the world and to self-govern. I think though that to get there, it's a very delicate balance because we're dealing with people, um, who, I mean, all of our, we're dealing with people and we need to, I feel like we need to prefigure the ways that we're going to be treating each other and to, you know, wag our finger at movements. Like that is not effective. I've, I, I from the very beginning went into Palestine uh, solidarity looking for anarchists. You know, I found five. Uh, there aren't very many. There's a lot. There were a lot more Israeli anarchists than there were Palestinians. I don't know the landscape right now of anarchism in Israel, but it does take a lot of trust. It also takes a lot of understanding of how much has been tried and how much has been destroyed, how many alternatives have been destroyed. And Israel has actively destroyed so many alternatives and keeps killing nonviolent folks. Like for example, the, the Palestinian who was part of the organizers of the March of Return in 2018, where it was peaceful march, uh, breaking the fence to go back to their lands. His family has all been killed in recent days by Israel. It's really difficult to have conversations that feel like they're coming from a genuine place when there isn't a recognition of how much has already been tried and where there isn't um, an understanding of why folks answer the way that they answer. I have a lot of critiques uh, of the left that supports, for example, Bashar al-Assad, the Iranian regime, Hezbollah, you know, and this has also split the Palestinian movement. Some went with Assad and some are against Assad. And these are all openings that for me, like I feel like my task is to accompany. And when I see these openings, you know, like we try to do something with them, but it takes, the, you know, folks understanding like where we're coming from, that it's coming from this place where we really are committed to doing something different. And again, it also entails us struggling where we are and we are in the United States in a settler colony and how are we doing things differently here? Like how can we create a model or many models, many inspirations for how we can do differently here with the settlers who live here and the natives from here, from these lands. Something I wanna point to everyone is this book, Islam and Anarchism, which is the book I've been waiting for uh, to learn more about Islam by, this is a Tahrir Square revolutionary, Mohammed Abdo, it was just published by Pluto Press. And it's someone who I've befriended. And we have, we share all of these critiques you're talking about, Phil, about the authoritarian left. And so my question, instead of going in to other movements and like battling over ideology, I now have one question. How can we share the world together with all of our difference? 
That's it. I don't care what your ideology is. I don't care what your religion is. I don't care what your philosophy, according to your religion, according to your spirituality, your philosophy, how can we share the world together while respecting each other's differences? I don't mean how can we share the world together by making everybody the same, which is what the Soviet Union and NATO wanted to do, first world versus second world, right? First world, everybody has to be capitalist. Second world, everybody has to be state communist. No, how do we create a world where many worlds fit? And I think that that can get us well beyond a lot of these tropes that we have, because a lot of the left learns through, through slogans, through certain personalities and who you're supposed to like and who you're not supposed to like, right? Instead of like all of us being critical thinkers of what is it that we want and what kind of ethics are we going to have along the way? The Zapatistas in a book, um, it's in Spanish, but part of it has been translated into um, English. These are letters between the philosopher Luis Villoro and Sub Marcos that talk about ethics in war. How can we have an ethics? Like what happens if we introduce ethics in war? And the way Marcos replies is by saying, well, with us, we are an army so that there, we no longer have to be an army. Like that's our goal. We are defending ourselves so that we no longer have to defend ourselves, so that there don't have to be armies. So our dissolution as an army will be our victory. That's that's very different from a lot of these left from above movements that do arm struggle and then go above and then they stay there as a, a military regime that controls the people. No, for the Zapatistas, introducing ethics into this question of war means dissolving the situation that creates the need to defend oneself. So again, how do we dismantle that above below structure is the big question, not just attacking the above constantly and then trying to be the above and controlling the people down below. Isra. So I just wanted to present maybe um, a different way to, you know, unlearn what we've learned as we are entering this space, uh, because this has been as has been an abandoned space uh, in terms of, you know, popular focus until the recent events. And um, the, the, the I think, again, um, thinking about the entire cause, you know, or that the map itself, um, scratch the cause, the map itself, um, it is really forcing our imagination into the nation state that we are supposedly um, examining and challenging and what it erects within each one of us as opposed to the borders. Um, one of the most uh, wonderfully written ethnographies, um, Jeff Holper, is um, an um, anthropologist that wrote an ethnography um, called An Israeli in Palestine. And it literally draws an image about um, a Zionist, uh, former Zionist Israeli, um, as they are working with, a, I think it's a scene of him and a Palestinian being toppled down a hill, pushed down a hill, both of them rolling. I mean, none of them died but basically being pushed down a hill to roll all the way to the bottom with a Palestinian whose house has been dispossessed is what made that person feel that their own identity ceased to exist when he dared oppose the demolition of a house. Um, it is a wonderful ethnography. Um, and I just say, if anyone has extra time to just you know um, give it a read, the other thing that I wanted to say is that um, for those that are outside of Palestine, again, just to, to give honor to those that are actually in the place, we cannot speak for them, but we can amplify their voices. For those of us that are abroad, I feel like it is on us, uh, Western by birth or Western by uh, conjunction, <laughs> to 
um, examine how every different framework has been applied in benefit of one side over the other. And are we going to allow a diversity of narratives in order for her to have a 360 about the case? Or are we constantly going, uh, because I can't win your secular, you're going to be opposed by those that are positioning this in a religious, uh, as a religious struggle. struggle. Uh, if you're going to be um, a right wing, then you can't even talk to the young, to the youth that cares about internal issues that you don't necessarily address. If you're going to be a leftist, you're going to position yourself as opposed to the, and, and the thing is, unless we hear more and more Palestinian voices from all perspectives, the narrative in the West will constantly be in favor of one camp over the other. Let's just, you know, maintain our curiosity, our humility as learners and try to learn from everyone. I mean, in the US especially, it's just like everyone who's not Christian might, you know, needs to uphold secularism, but every Christian needs to quote the Bible and throw Jesus in all of our faces all the time. Um, Pat Robinson died recently and Netanyahu himself called him the like Israel, I think I'm quoting him loosely because I don't want to remember him verbatim, that uh, basically uh, Israel has never had a friend like Pat Robinson. And because many there of his influence in rallying um, evangelical Americans uh, to be blindly, you know, selecting one side over the other. And I think we are in a moment right now where like the pendulum is a little bit you know swinging in the other direction and we all can make sure that it's not a sharp uh swing but we should all welcome narratives if you're more more read on the israeli side you need to read more on the palestinian side and if you're more emotionally connected to the palestinian side you need to listen to you know the the jewish people in your community and the, those that are outside of our communities. Um, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. I love that. Yeah, listening to, there's so many diverse ideas and that's what's so difficult about asking like, what is it that Palestinians want? What is it that Israelis want, right? Um, because we're talking about a, a, a nationality, which means you can get a whole kind of array of what folks want. There isn't a single spokesperson for, for anyone, even Israelis, even their prime minister. A lot of Israelis don't believe that they, that, you know, they that he represents them. And I think, yeah, going into this with a critical lens, like what is everyone's assumptions in their narratives, right? Are they assuming that we can only stick with the above and the below? Like, is that where the fear is coming from? That they fear slipping? down below or are they trying to go above like and if so then why don't we talk about something else too like there's an opening there and I actually think that right now after October 7 because Palestinians had spent the last 30 years trying to get the above to accept them as human beings as worthy of life and, and those above have betrayed them so much, they are seeing that others below are with them. And not only are others below with them, others below are seeing how those above reacted and are taking it personally, even if we're not Palestinian, because we see ourselves. Like that's gonna happen to us if this genocide is allowed to continue, then they're gonna get a, a green light to do it to all of us. And that's why it can't continue. Right, because this is the world from above that's doing this. And so this is an opening. I'm always looking for these cracks, these openings of what's next. That Hezbollah, you know, had like this whole Hollywood production as if they were going to enter. And then, you know, they completely disappointed the Palestinians on Friday when they announced that, you know, they, they weren't really that, you know, the regimes, the, the Muslim and Arab regimes 
have always given lip service to the Palestinian cause, saying that's why they need to build up their militaries. And then it turns out that they use those weapons against their own people from Iran to eat, like all of them, right? Like we saw that with uh, the Arab Spring in 2011 on, and the world has witnessed that, that it's the regimes turning their weapons on their own people. And after using all of this language about liberating Palestine and Jerusalem, now is the time and they're not going to turn those weapons on behalf of Palestine. Like it, it has an opening for us to be able to critique what exactly are these regimes doing and even Palestinians themselves. I feel like this is a rupture among the Palestinian struggle where they're going to be very skeptic skeptical of going up to the above and are gonna wanna come down below, but we need to take that initiative and strengthen that cleavage. And also recognizing that these regimes are really there just to preserve themselves above anything. They're just giving lip service again to all of our struggles. And so there's a lot of openings here. That's why I am hopeful. I'm not optimistic that this is gonna get better, but I am hopeful that folks are going to, because we're witnessing a lot of us non-Palestinians, what I'm witnessing online it, and in person is people being as traumatized as I was when I first started learning about this and, and having to have like a self-reckoning of what your, our ethics are and what kind of world we want and how we're gonna struggle and also doing their own research because this means losing a lot of friends, losing a lot of opportunities. And so this means that, you know, people are looking for what's right. It's not like this pontification on hypotheticals. What if this, what if that? No, people are looking for the truth. They're truth seeking right now. And so, and this is far more sophisticated. Folks are a lot smarter than I was when I first started. And so there's a lot of hope for, for and, and for people to, even if it's going to be difficult, even if it's going to get harder, at least we're going to do what we all thought was right. And we're learning, I think, this question of dignity and en masse. And for me, what that means is being able to refuse those things you do not like, being able to say no, because it violates you as a person, you with your integrity, you with your values. And so I think that we're going to see a shift and it's going to take a lot of, I think, um, generosity to folks in struggle. Like, for example, in Palestine, like being confronted with questions that a lot of us have never been confronted with, you know, and and, and trying to understand, as, as you're saying, is that I like the different kinds of narratives and trying to understand where people are coming from, whether we agree or we don't agree. We need to understand roots of where people are coming from. And that's where I think we can have these conversations to move forward. I'll leave it at that. We've been here for two and a half hours. I could be out here for two and a half days, but I'm sure everyone's got stuff to do. Thank you so much, Kiki. Um, I learned so much as I always do when I listen to you and from our conversations also. Um, and I, w this is recorded, we will send out the recording. Um, and is there a way that folks can learn more about the work that you do? Yeah, I have, um, I have a website, kiki.org, Q-U-I-Q-U-I.org. And it's got links to podcasts and like YouTubes and discussions and, um, I'll have my book up there once once it's ready. I'm hoping to have a really good draft to circulate to friends by the end of January, and then we'll see what happens. But I'm trying to write it as fast as I can. Um, so that's that's probably the best. I just got on social media, um, which I can't stand, but I understand the reason for you know for needing to be on there because this is a, a a narrative battle as much as it is one on the ground, and so. Um, I'm on Instagram and Twitter, but who knows how long those platforms are gonna allow me to be there. That's why I have a website because that's the one that I can control. And I also have my email, kikivish at protonmail.com. And I'll put that on the chat. Thank you so much.
Thank you, everybody, wow. and your questions and thoughts and hearts. Very cool. Please stay in touch if y'all have any any questions. If you want to like debate, I always I always love this. I I. Uh, come, let's come into this question. How can we share the world together while maintaining and respecting difference? That's it. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you. Thank you and goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.